Hi everybody. Naimbaga maalam yo amin. Hi everyone. <clears throat> so happy to see you all here and so many amazing uh, laing students and friends and family members. Welcome everyone. Um, we're going to get started right on time because we have so much to talk about today. Um, and I'm going to just make sure, can I ask everyone to please mute yourselves? You should be coming in muted, but I'm going to mute you if you're not. <laughs> Sorry. And um, yeah, we are here today. Everybody is gathered to talk about weaving, Philippine weaving. This is going to be an awesome conversation. So um, I am recording. So just make sure if you don't want to have your face on here or you don't want your name on the recording, no. feel free to change that right now. Um, and if anyone has any questions, we're going to ask people. Oops, sorry, you're not muted. Sorry, I'm muting you all. Um, if you have any questions, we're going to save them to the end because we do have a lot to get through today. And um, yeah, so I will just start. Um, my name is Rebecca Maria Goldschmidt. I am one of the co-founding members of Laing Hawaii. We are a heritage language preservation organization based on Oahu in um, the sovereign kingdom of Hawaii. And we also would like to acknowledge that as Filipinos doing work in Hawaii, um, this is, well, I'm actually, parentheses i'm in japan right now but i'm also wanting to make sure that we do a land acknowledgement for the work that we do in hawaii um that that is the the original place of the kanaka maoli people and we believe in our um shared liberation from a lot of the things that continue to oppress native hawaiian people and part of that journey for us as Filipinos has been learning our languages learning our cultural practices and um also standing in solidarity with the Native Hawaiian struggles. So we also are here today with Anya Lim at Ant Hill Fabric, who are our awesome co-sponsors, co-collaborators. And we have several amazing weavers and artists and cultural advocates here today. So I am not gonna say that much more and I will be moderating the conversation, but if anyone has any questions or problems with technology, you can message me directly. And um, also lastly, want to thank Hawaii People's Fund who have been amazing supporters and funders who are helping support this program today. And um, I'm just gonna pass the mic to Anya who's gonna do a brief introduction. All right, maayong buntag, maayong gabi um, magandang hapon, tanghali sa inyong lahat. Um, I am based in Cebu, so um, I am the co-founder of Ant Hill Fabric Gallery, and we are a social and a cultural enterprise that works to provide sustainable livelihood to Filipino craft artisans across the country. And it is such a pleasure um, to have this heart woven conversation with everyone in different time zones and different parts of the world. Um, Rebecca and I were just sharing earlier how this has probably probably been a year or two in the making. Um, and it's been very um, much integral part of our culture and until to actually host conversations like this, but we usually do it in our pop-ups and Jeanette has been um, in several of our pop-ups and has participated in these conversations. So um, we just wanted to be very open and fluid and make meaningful connections and gather valuable insights about our culture and how we can celebrate it more. So I will not also say much. Um, what brought Rebecca and I together, aside from that laing, is my favorite um, Philip Bicol dish because I'm also Bicolana um, is another another B which is Binacol. Um, I think years ago there was a huge controversy around uh, the use of Binacol and um, but I'm no expert. Um, we have here Manang Rachel who will talk more about that. So I'll pass the mic on to Manang who can introduce herself and talk about um, Binacol. Thank you again for being here. 
Hello, uh, naimbag nga Rabi'i. Kada kayo amin, uh, Aldao, Malem, uh, whichever applies. Uh, I'm Rachel Lozada. You can really call me Manang Rachel. If you are under the age of 38, which is the, uh, or 37, which is my youngest son's age, please call me Tita because I have earned the right to be called uh, uh, a more senior <laughs> uh, term of environment. So uh, I'm in San Francisco, uh, which is uh, uh, this part of the Bay Area is unceded Ohlone Ramay Tush land as far as acknowledging um, ancestral domain for the Native American people. And I have been weaving starting since 2013. I'm an immigrant. I came here almost 30 years ago. Uh, I started weaving with uh, Kalinga Fornia Laga, doing Kalinga backstrap weaving, and then being Ilocano and Ibanag myself, uh, I always um, intended to uh, pursue Ilocano weaving. And I had despair that I would not be able to do that, having no um, master weaver to mentor me here locally uh, or that I could identify, uh, but I was able to, you know, kind of like go about it in several uh, processes. So the only um, clarification I wanted to make around Binacol, and since Annie had referenced that controversy, I think from a couple of years ago, or sorry, middle of 2021, something like that. Um, so Binacol is actually, this is not, uh, the Binacol is a technique. It's an umbrella term uh, that describes the technique used for weaving such things as kusikos or alipogpog. So this is, if we're referring to this design, uh, we have to specify that it is either kusikos or alipogpog. You can make your choice. Kusikos is easier to pronounce. Uh, that means whirlpool. Alipogpog means whirlwind. Uh, and it's been a, almost like a misnomer, everyone now just refers to it as binacol. There's so many designs under binacol, including abanico, uh, cat's paw, uh, 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 what do you call it? It's like banig and all that stuff. So just to clarify that, because I'm encountering that a lot uh, locally and I wanted to, you know, we, we have to um, be able to uh, represent uh, that more accurately. So thank you. I'll pass it on so whoever Anya will decide. Um, maybe we can head on to one of our um, design collaborators who ha we have been working with, I think since 2016, if I'm not mistaken, and who also uh, uses binacol and recently explored the use of Pina fiber. Um, Jeanette, can you talk more about Maari? Uh, hi, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Jeanette. I am coming to you all from Twin Peaks, which is like an hour outside of Los Angeles on Serrano native land. Um, it's like 9 p.m. here and I'm like trying to hype myself up right now. <laughs> um, so I'm one of the co-founders of Maari. Um, my, me and my best friend started the business in 2016 and we were Filipino Americans trying to connect, um, with our Filipino cultural identity. Um, so we started Maari, which is the Filipino American design studio and lifestyle brand. <clears throat> and so, um, when we started the brand, we found Anya through a, a mutual friend and really Ant Hill um, launched like our creative process and like, um, self-discovery, I guess, of our like Filipino heritage. We've learned so much through our partnership with them. And, um, I will say that like Maari has always started as like a passion side project of ours, but as the years have gone on, we've just, um, we're still going at it. And we recently just launched a collection that works with Pina. Um, and so, you know, I am no weaver. I consider myself a learner all the time when it comes to Philippine craft and culture and preserving traditions. And Ivy, who's my business partner, who's in New York, <clears throat> that's why she's not here because it's midnight there. <laughs> um, 
we definitely like approach our brand with the perspective and lens of trying to respect our culture, not to step on people's toes. We're trying to learn, create, um, like carve out a place in the marketplace for these artists and crafts to exist. Um, we really focus on design adaptation to kind of let, um, to kind of bring these traditional crafts into more of a modern design environment. Um, and I think that's all I'm gonna say for now. <laughs> Um, I love participating in these conversations with Anya. They usually end with like all of us crying at some point. Um, and I, I'm just like excited to be here and I, I'm excited to learn from everyone that's here, including like the audience and everyone too. So thank you, Salamat. Yeah, thank you for staying late, um, Jeanette, and for keeping your energy up. I appreciate it. Um, yay. Uh, next is um, Kate, who's supposed to be in New York, but fortunately, she's in the Philippines, so she can stay up late. And not stay up late, but join us. Um, I met Kate, I think, in 2019, but um, she's amazing. She's a mom, also a weaver, and she was studying at that time, so juggling everything all at once. And that was, I think, the early years of Nara Studio, and I'm so proud how much it has grown through the years and very grateful that she's always been very passionate about, you know, um, putting our Philippine weaves in the map. Um, Kate. Oh, thank you for the kind int intro. Uh, so, magandang hapon. I'm here from uh, Tagaytay right now uh, in New York. Uh, I'm an artist. I'm a weaver. I love to study all kinds of textiles, different techniques, uh, histories of textiles. Um, I'm My background is museums and fine arts. Um, and also I started in our studio and really, uh, my goal is to really celebrate everyone who makes things by hand, especially, uh, Filipinos, uh, who not only weave, uh, and create really. Um, so I really hope in this talk to continue, uh, learning from everyone. Um, uh, Manang Rachel, thank you for sharing. Uh, especially about Binacol. Uh, I had also the experience of not having to learn uh, from somebody close to me uh, being in New York. So I know what that feels like. Um, if I might meander, but <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I hope that more weavers um, are feel it in their bones and in their blood and um, we continue to uh, make the weaving industry grow. We continue to wear uh, our our fabrics. And yeah, I'm really excited to continue this conversation. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Kita. And saving the best for last is a modern weaver. So I met Judith, well, we've been friends since since a long time ago, but um, we've started working together uh, during the pandemic. She has been graciously hosting weaving workshops with us online and making use also of our scraps and taking inspiration from the traditional patterns and the fabrics. And um, I think uh, Judith represents the future generation or the younger generation of like how we're able to also to sustain um, the craft in in um, in creative innovative ways. Judith, hi, um, gandang hapon. Uh, I am based in Manila. I am uh, like like Anya mentioned. I'm a modern weaver. I also consider myself um, a learner and also a teacher. So I teach modern weaving, um, mostly here in Manila. I also travel to Cebu. <laughs> and then I also taught in the, um, in Anya store in uh, Angel. Um, I teach modern weaving and I got into it in 2018. I started um, teaching in 2019 when my friends um, asked me how they can learn it as well. And I was amazed at how um, I guess I've, I've known weaving for when when I started working, I I didn't encounter it before in school or in a, in in another way. I only discovered it in 2018, and that's um, when I learned I can also do it um, with um, other materials rather um, other than 
um, an upright loom. Um, that's when I uh, got into it. I'm a self-taught weaver and um, also very amazed and um, uh, into handcraft. So I teach kids in homeschool um, communities and also those enthusiasts who want to learn more about weaving and um, to also get more appreciation on how the process is um, made. So I always mention that um, uh, modern weaving is not at all different from um, the traditional weaving. It just use modern um, techniques and modern um, and more uh, accessible items. But in the process, you also get to learn the, um, that it is a slow craft that should also be, in, I hope that could be, um, uh, tied up in schools and more kids and more people get to learn um, weaving that is also culturally um, present in, um, in our country. So aside from that, I also am a, a, a peasant advocate and I'm part of SACA. It's an artist alliance for um, genuine agrarian reform that also um, works together with farmers um, to, um, to, of course, um, get the genuine agrarian reform and land distribution. So most of, um, some of the weavers are also farmers. So that's a good um, thing to know for all of us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Judith. Thank you for um, bringing in all of your, your histories, everyone, and your experience as weavers and not weavers and weave appreciators. Um, we have so many awesome questions that came from our conversation, Anya and I's conversation over the past couple of years, and also from everyone who RSVP'd, you all sent in a lot of really great questions too. So we're going to start off with some of the things um, that were coming out of the conversations that Anya and I were having, and we're going to lead into some of the audience questions, and then we'll save time at the end for a, a, a kind of more robust Q&A. And I just want to let everyone know we're probably going to end around half an hour in about an hour uh whatever that time is for you like we'll end at the half an hour in about an hour so let's just get into it and um yeah thanks everyone so much for being here if you need to leave no worries um yeah and I think the first question that we really were thinking about um and I think this is great that Judith you mentioned your activism and your advocacy around peasant culture and and um, people in the Philippines is, you know, what we see weaving not only as our cultural practice, as our embodied practice, a spiritual practice, but it also has a lot of economic implications. And in fact, the history of weaving in the Philippines is one of economic independence and economic, you know, um, autonomy for a lot of different people. So um, I realize I have you still spotlighted, Judith. This doesn't have to apply to you, but for, for the whole panel, we're wondering what does cultural independence mean to you in the context of weaving? And Anya is also on this panel too. So everyone's open to answer this question. What does cultural independence mean to you when you're thinking about weaving? All right, um, maybe I can uh, talk a little bit about it first. Um, I think for for us to be culturally independent, we have to think about um, independence first. Um, uh, independence is, of course, being um, subjected to ownership of something, and I believe that we get to um, um, we have to think about the people who does the the weaving tradition and also the people who will also benefit from it. So. Um, first and foremost, it's the weavers who um, who are who are part of the production of the textiles, and for them to have the cultural independence is to, of course, earn from the labor or the um, first um, earn from what they do and for the tradition that they are keeping um, alive, and also um, for them to um, for for them because most of the most of the if, if we're gonna spotlight the Ilocano first, so traditionally and historically they've been weaving for um for decades 
and for centuries. And most of, they started as being farmers as well. Um, and that's what they do. They, th that's what they do beside weaving. And um, so I, I would hear a lot of my friends who would encounter weaving for the first time, they would say, oh, I visited um, Ilocos and they would see that in their homes or they would also, the locals to be local um, to Ilocos, and they would say they know this because um, because most of the weavers is uh, weaving is a family thing. Like they would have the looms at their homes. Um, the whole family will be involved in the whole production, so the the whole warping and the whole weaving process. Um, especially before when they would um, be um, they would be farming cotton as well, and that's how the whole thing was processed from the from the thread down to the the um, textile. So I guess part of it, um, a, another thing would be for us also to to own um, the textile as well. So I would I wouldn't be surprised not to see textile a lot as homes here in um, Manila. Then um, I guess being being more involved with it. So aside from just purchasing, is also um, um, because it's not really part of the education and growing up, I did, I did not really know, um, textiles until I encountered it. And I guess working with, um, artists who do, um, textiles. So, yeah. Thanks, Judith. Does anyone else want to, oh, Anya, go ahead. Yeah, um, probably like, you know, I wanted to share because I feel like in Antel, I, we've had the privilege um, as an enabler and as, 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 as like an entity, I guess, that's in the middle of the ecosystem, we've had the privilege to witness how this independence has unfolded in our different stakeholders. And um, it, it was actually in these heart woven conversations that I feel like first really understood or it's clicked to me what it means for a proud weave wearer, um, especially among, I guess, the diaspora to embrace what cultural independence mean. And, and Jeanette was in, in this, in this um, heart woven conversation and this pop-up in LA and I can never forget um, this girl. I mean, it's a shame that it's, it's a shame that I can't remember her name, but um, she, was very emotional when when and when I asked like what does it mean for you to wear a weave? She was very emotional and and um she said that you know wearing a weave for her is as is a is self-expression. It is it is my representation. It's a form of representation. Um and beyond that to her when she's clothed in a bin a collar, whatever weave it is, to her it's like very healing it's healing from that intergenerational trauma uh, that that part of her life where she's able to set herself apart from the narratives that she grew up in that her parents and her parents parents um subscribed to to survive you know and and to me like i was having goosebumps the whole time because it didn't click to me that way but for someone who is a minority in another country, that's how she's able to practice independence and be liberated from, from, um, from these narratives. Um, and, and that's really like what it means to be able to represent our values. Like to me, independence is being able to celebrate and live your values and, and embrace your identity. Like what we create, what we wear is who we are. Um, but on the other side of the spectrum, it's also been very inspiring and, and really amazing to witness weavers come out of shame and transform that to pride. Like in the past, it's not something like the craft, weaving as a craft is not something that, that weavers celebrate. They undervalue it. That's why it's never something that provided them sustainable livelihood because it's not priced right um but but in the context of livelihood we've also witnessed how that has 
changed 180 and and now they're able to embrace the culture and the craft with pride versus shame and weaving provided them that and and now especially among the younger generation like in the past it's not perceived as somebody that at something as something that that could be their profession it's just perceived as something they will do on the side or something that they don't they don't even appreciate but now like what we hear from younger weavers is, you know, because I know how to weave and because I honor this craft, I'm I'm not compelled or I don't seek to assimilate or absorb other culture other than my own thinking that my culture is inferior. Now I think that now I appreciate my my culture. I don't think my culture is inferior, so I will celebrate it. And that's not something that's um, true among a lot of young people in weaving communities back then. Another, maybe another thing is that the aspect of pamana or passing on a legacy to, to a younger generation also gives so much independence for the elder women that, you know, I have something to pass on. I have a gift to offer um, the younger generation. And, and to me that, that, um, that I think that transformation from both the weaver and the weaver is is really magical. And I think that's really the essence of what cultural independence is, because you're able to um, kind of establish these values and these norms that 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 resist foreign culture or, you know, that resist having to like um, subscribe to to um, foreign or colonial mentality like in the past it's always i want to wear um branded clothes or i want to wear um lacoste a crocodile on my shirt or something like that and and um younger women in in weaving communities their idea of a profession is sitting on a desk and being in front of the computer but now it's different so i think that's 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 really what independence is Can I piggyback on Anya? So as someone that's like in the di diaspora, when we started Ma'ari, like weaving was a thing that we were like, oh, we need to explore this more because as we started develop, so Ivy and I are designers by trade. And so as we were like concepting what our brand would be, we weren't necessarily gonna focus on Philippine artist, textiles, ceramics, We it wasn't, surrounded around that. But as we started discovering weavers from other countries, we started researching more about the Philippines. And to piggyback on Anya's point, like as a diaspora person, weaving to for me is a connection to cultural roots that I never had access to. And the choice of materials that we use in Philippine textiles are directly related to the environment. And so like that that just brings on like another level of sustainability and like ties to our motherland that we don't necessarily have here in Los Angeles. And like on top of that, it's preserving the techniques like what Anya was saying is like, it's a no brainer for us to like have a business in something that involves this because I feel like it's our responsibility as diaspora to ask these questions and seek these communities and find these artisans and work with them um, for the sake of preserving techniques and, and our culture. <laughs> Hi, Rebecca, may I jump in right behind Jeanette? Um, again, uh, uh, just to uh, underscore even further uh, the perspective being in the diaspora. So I think the term cultural independence, I kind of had a, a I, I had a quizzical uh, reaction to it initially. Uh, so I thought more about it. I looked up a couple of things. So I think it framing it squarely uh, and centrally within cultural, the, the perspective of cultural decolonization for us, particularly in the diaspora, but I would say even in the homeland, uh, that is key. Um, because the way of, uh, we know what happens to traditional and indigenous crafts and arts, if they are not valued and they're not uh, promoted, they're not uh, appreciated and sustained, they will disappear. They will be taken over. 
by mass production, by ready to wear, by, um, you know, like cheap <laughs> produced uh, uh, textiles for, uh, that will come from like, you know, thousands of miles away or very expensive, uh, arbitrarily expensive priced um, goods that may not necessarily reflect the, the value. Whereas in traditional and indigenous weaving and textiles, uh, the value is different. The value is culture itself. It, it's our history itself and our, our identity itself. And in, in the diaspora, we are in a constant fight to, uh, to show up, to represent, to um, take a slice of any pie that is important to uh, represent our Filipino American and Filipino immigrant community. If we don't do that, nobody else will do that for us. Um, so for me, in the context of weaving, it is about um, valuing the traditional and indigenous um, and not privileging, uh, you know, like the foreign and uh, mass produce and um, that does not authentically or as well represent the cultural symbolisms of what the weaving, the product itself, but also the tradition, the process and um, the, the specific weaving culture within the different communities. And that's a very diverse um, uh, um, population in itself. One thing I wanted to relate in terms of uh, sort of the valuing, uh, Anya was refer uh, kind of like alluding to it uh, or was mentioning it earlier in um, the project that I'm currently doing, which is in a Belga in Dayon. So that means uh, Ilocano handwoven um, hammock or cradle. Uh, and it is a project to uh, weave the first Ilocano blanket woven, at least in contemporary times that I know of, that as far as I can determine. And this will honor the first wave of manongs, uh, predominantly manongs, but also manangs, and they were predominantly Ilocano uh, uh, post-American occupation, um, uh, colonization of the Philippines. Uh, immediately, what was one of the first things like labor recruitment for uh, uh, sugar and pineapple plantations in Hawaii, uh, you know, backbreaking labor as sacadas um, to become uh, cannery workers in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest, and then farm workers up and down uh, the West Coast, but more, more uh, predominantly uh, California. So um, we see a lot of Ilocanos uh, there in the projects that I, uh, the project that I've done. So besides weaving the blanket, it really is a, a community engaged project that I, I have been inviting and trying to struggle to like really create the space so that more of the community's hands and hopefully more and more uh, descendants of Manons and Manans themselves can actually uh, put their hands on the, on the finished project. But one of the earliest workshops that I did in uh, 2021, and it has continued to, to uh, reveal itself uh, to be a truism, that uh, a lot of our um, millennials and Gen Z, uh, but even myself, I did not know particular, uh, how to say that, like exactly that my great grandmother on my maternal side uh, was a weaver. I didn't get confirmation of it and her name uh, until 2019. Um, so all this, and then and then her child, her daughters were all weavers. Which is, if you were locus norte, you could not escape weaving. You were, it's almost mandatory. Uh, so I've also encountered um, that here in in the weaving workshops that younger uh, generations would come and say, uh, Manang, I just discovered like two months ago that. My maternal, uh, my my paternal grandmother had brought two blankets with her that she wove in the Ilocos region, brought it to her to with her to Hawaii, where she worked in the plantations, and then to Alaska, and then to California. This particular grandmother did the whole uh, scope of uh, of that labor uh, migration, and now um, her two grandchildren have been bequeathed by by the father. Uh, the grandmother's uh, blankets. And so why the question here is that why is it that my grand, uh, my grand aunts, when they came from Ilocos to Manila, you know, nobody brings the looms to Manila in that generation in the 
for, uh, 40s and 50s and 60s and, and so forth. Uh, maybe only more now. Um, and let alone, nobody will bring or claim that on honor of, of knowing and weaving if you migrate from the Philippines to the US or Canada. So I think there's, there should be as equal pride uh, for us to claim our elders, our relatives who are nurses, lawyers, doctors, uh, uh, engineers, what have you. Equally, we should elevate um, our, our ancestor weavers, our elders who are weavers, uh, who are, who make, you know, uh, who are dancers, who may have um, uh, been chanting uh, in passion for like decades and decades. We should be telling our, our, our relatives, our younger generation, that this is your history. So it's not just professional degrees that we should be um, taking pride of, but reclaiming all of that art, artisanal and craft work. Because there really was a time that nobody bought anything. We all made things. Everything that we ate and used, we made by ourselves. So I think that should be a huge reclamation. And that to me really means cultural decolonization and cultural independence. So. I just want to say that when we started Ma'ari, my Filipino mother freaked out and was like, why are you going to start a business in a country that I worked my whole life to like leave and better myself from? And um, since we, we've we started Ma'ari, it's been seven or eight years now. My relationship with my mom has come full circle and like it was such a healing thing for both of us, I think. And um, I would love to see more of her generation celebrate our generation diving into the arts and picking up, you know, these traditional techniques and practices. Thanks everyone. Um, I don't know if Kate, if you want to add anything to this question oh. or we can also move on. Sure. Yeah. Um... You know, I think my thoughts when it came to cultural independence went totally elsewhere. But for me, I guess as a as an artist, uh, really what came to mind was the idea of authorship um, that weavers themselves, whether at uh, the level where they identify uh, culturally at the local level, national level, um, at whatever cultural level they identify as, that they um, have, um, I guess, the ownership and authorship of uh, what they make. Um, and I find that this is really important um, because sometimes I find that um, we can, as Filipinos, uh, claim all the textiles um and i really feel that if it should be the weavers themselves who have uh the right um and independence to have a say in what they make um primarily um and first of all um and i think especially as a brand, I think I try to, I guess, um, I, I don't want to say like negate myself, but I think, um, I think it's more important that we always recognize like um, the the weavers that they should always have, um, I guess the really the the primary power of. Uh, who says what is cultural appropriation? Who says what is right and wrong in terms of what they uh, are weaving? Um, and that's what uh, I think of when I think of uh, cultural independence. Yeah, thank you, Kate. I think that's a really important point, um, especially when as people in diaspora, second, first, 1.5, second, three, whatever, four, et cetera, five generations away from the Philippines. And I think that kind of comes back to what Judith was mentioning in the beginning, just in terms of peasant 
agricultural based life and the realities of you know the economic situation in the Philippines and that the people who need to be deciding absolutely um yeah their their autonomy and their independence should not be based on you know romantic notions of yeah diasporic mm-hmm. visions of what you know going back to the land might be like and I think that's um like a really huge kind of reckoning that a lot of us have to do in in terms of our own personal journeys of reflection and of course um also you know if we're going to get really into the realities of the economics and our relationships with capitalism our relationships with these ways of being um obviously we all have to function in this particular universe (laughs) as it's working now right right we're all trying to do our best in those ways um but it is really important to just remember that our lives as Filipino Americans or Filipino Canadians or etc um are are different than the people who continue to weave in their homes um and that is a primary source of income for them it's a very different experience than you know mine here in Japan or you know Jeanette in LA or something like that so I think this is actually a good um segue into a question that's kind of about business practice and weaving practice and how how everyone individually addresses um cultural continuity and preservation and what what is important to to preserve and also you know something that i also think a lot about is material um and even like again language and the names of things when i was in the ilocos in 2018 i believe um i was talking to a weaver in north uh, ilocos norte and they were talking about calling the what i think is the window pane weave name they were calling it the hashtag and i was like oh that's so interesting you know like and the, these are these are weavers you know working that's their that's their job that's their their livelihood um calling the the window pane the hashtag and I thought oh that's so interesting what an important element of the cultural change that is happening and if that is the change that they're making who are we to continue with you know there's a lot of stuff going on just in that that one little encapsulated experience and moment but I kind of want to ask a little bit about what you all think about you know what is important to preserve I guess is is the question and and how are you doing that and it's open to everyone. I would love to start this off. Um, you know, since I come also from a museum background, uh, my particular interests are older textiles. Uh, so in terms of what we call preservation. I think um, a study of older textiles and techniques is uh, something uh, that we should be not prioritizing, um, but uh, keeping in mind. Uh, I understand cultural, um, you know, there are cultural shifts in weaving, uh, especially uh, to accommodate uh, tastes uh, and the, basically the marketplace. Uh, at the same time, I think we should hold uh, value in uh, what is traditional to us um, and not forget uh, kind of the the skills that we have, uh, the materials that we have uh, here in the Philippines. Uh, I think we can keep both of those at the same time. Um, so I would love to see that continue to have happen. I know that there are organizations here that are doing that. Um, so I hope uh, those those things continue um, to grow. Um, I can share within the context of um, our work in Anthill uh, as a social and a cultural enterprise. 
cultural sustainability is kind of at the core of the work that we do. And I think that's also one of the things that sets us apart. Um, and the reason why we're able to, to serve and, and, and scale our capacity. So in terms of like cultural continuity and preservation, um, because I think um, we have a development background from the get-go, it was very important for us to establish a program that will facilitate this. So in Antil, we have our Community Enterprise Development Program, um, which is a community-based um, capacity building program that supports our partner craft artisans by building their capacity in terms of uh, managing their business, their community enterprise, and how they're able to to stay in not just the tradition and the and the craft, but also their livelihood, and at the same time, um, gain entrepreneurial mindset so they can become self reliant and independent. And in these in this program, we have we come in like our first intervention is usually through cultural appreciation. I mean, earlier in the conversation, we've talked about. Um, poverty of identity, not just among the diaspora community, but also in the motherland. And that was one of our pain points we wanted to address a um, decade ago before um, when we started Ant Hill. It was always deemed uncool to wear weaves. Like they'd say, oh, but do it. Like, why am I, why am I going to wear a tablecloth, a placemat, a bed cover, a curtain? You know, um, it's not something that's celebrated. And with the weavers, when you ask them, like, why do you weave? The primary motivation is always income. It puts food on the table. It secondary or probably tertiary is like because it's my culture, it's part of who I am. So we want we kind of had to open the dialogue. Um, and as what Manang Rachel said, kind of just allow them to have a safe space for discovering what um, this means to them in, in like an ancestral context or in within their family dynamic, uh, what, what Judith mentioned earlier, what does this, what does weaving mean for them? So just deepen that cultural appreciation of what um, the craft means for them. And then the second intervention is through product design and innovation. And, and this is actually what um, entices young women or young weavers to participate in the exploration and then discovery of what else can I do with this craft, with the material, um, and adapt it to like my truth and my reality now, given that, you know, I'm, uh, I'm in a different generation. I'll, I'll set a, a very, uh, uh, a, a specific example, when Jeanette and, and Ivy first approached us, they wanted an apricot shade because um, uh, <laughs> Ivy is very big on brand and, and they had a very, very specific color of apricot. And it took us, I don't know, probably eight months and we couldn't get the shade right. And the ladies were getting impatient and they said, okay, we're just going to go there and visit you to actually understand why it's very difficult for the weavers to achieve this certain color. Um, and true enough, when we, when we uh, visited the community, they said, well, we've never seen an apricot. Like, how are we able to, to determine the color? And it was so humbling. Yeah, there was no word for apricot in their vocabulary and we're like oh. exactly <laughs> yeah like it's it, I think it's not enough that you give them swatches or colors and pantones because that's kind of not within the context of how they communicate um yeah uh, but but that um integrating product design and innovation into the program allows them to um explore and adapt to um, how I can sustain this craft um, in a manner that, uh, you know, that interests me or excites me or in a manner that adapts to modern times. And then I think the flagship program that we have that really supports cultural continuity is our master and apprentice program. So we augment the income of our master weavers by 20% with a condition um, that they 
uh, teach an apprentice. And this was um, something that was incentivized in the past, but now it's kind of independently running on its own. And this actually encouraged uh, the practice of um, of serving elders just like during their summer vacations, like even kids as young as um, six and seven and 12 would, you know, just hang out at the weaving center and observe. Um, and yeah, so I think these, these programs integrated into the way we work with our partner artisans is our way of um, continuing culture. Um, but I think when you ask back, like what needs to be preserved, I think the, I think for, for, for me personally, what really needs to be preserved is how do we keep them and make them stay in the loom? Because right now the reality is in the Philippines is it's the challenge is how do you compete with like the fourth industrial revolution and all these machines coming in. And yesterday I had a meeting with the Department of Trade and Industry and their interest sometimes uh, is scale and um, capacity and, 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 and volume and production. And I've, we've been telling them, we've done that. We can do that. We can provide volume. We don't have to compromise um, the human element to how we create things. So I think to me, that's really what we need to, to preserve. And, and that can only be, I feel like that could only be facilitated if like we're able to strengthen the ecosystem. And a huge part of that is also farming. Um, which is something that's, you know, it's another conversation, but it's something that um, is something that I think has a lot of gaps within the context of like where we work in the Philippines. So, yeah. Rebecca, Hi, may I so, chime in? Oh, go, 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 Tita. <laughs> sorry. Okay, okay sorry. Um, so, so. I guess I always um, being where I am and uh, my perspective being in the diaspora, and primarily uh, weaving as an as a artistic pra practice. Although I have a little side gig <laughs> selling selling um, merchandise, uh, but that's not my uh, priority. Uh, that's not my primary focus. I would say what needs to be preserved and continued is <laughs> literally lahat, lahat, lahat. I mean, all of it. Um, uh, and in fact, I, I feel a little bit more pressure about reclaiming what has been lost or what is about to disappear. Um, uh, point in fact, uh, uh, you know, when I visited uh, Kalinga, uh, Ma, Mabilong, Luwagan, Kalinga, and, you know, it was able to immerse with the weavers there a couple of times um, several years ago. Um, so I saw designs that were not um, uh, were different than, uh, and of, they showed me some vintage ones. So I said, um, "Oh, how come this is not like so common?" Uh, or I'll say, "Like, oh, can you know, like the giant fern in Kalinga uh, backstrap weaving?" So they'll say, "Like, oh, because imana it's not popular, so hindi hindi mabenta. You know, it's not saleable." So really it's market driven, right? So if it's not saleable, why would they keep producing it? They'll produce what the market wants because their objective is to, to have a return on, on their um, investment and their labor. Um, so it's really interesting when, when not only an outsider from let's say um, metropolitan area, but from the diaspora, they really pay attention to what we pay attention to as well, the weavers. So they're amazed that, oh, you're really interested. Why do you, why do you want to learn backstrap weaving? We barely want to even like sustain it. And there you are wanting to, you know, uh, sit on your haunches on the floor for hours and hours. Um, so we explain to them, you know, the whole, the whole meaning, but it's really important for them to know what we're interested in. So that, like say that giant fern design is not so popular. So that also means that younger weavers um, are not weaving it and not learning to weave it. So that's one of the things I said, like eventually it will disappear. Another case in point, 
uh, Ilocano uh, weaving start and, and it neg weaving started with backstrap weaving as well before uh, whether it's, you know, I don't know the debate whether it's Spanish colonialists who brought the upright loom, the pedal loom, or whether that somehow also came from China. I'm not gonna debate that. I'll leave that to um, our dear Marian Pastor Rosses to research further and I can um, support her efforts. Um, so, but I wanted to, uh, so I've been asking my contacts, um, even uh, with the National Museum in, in Vega, where can I, um, who can make me, or how can I get an Ilocano backstrap loom? So the initial reaction was, oh, Manang, you know, we don't encourage you acquiring vintage. I, I'm not gonna acquire vintage. I'm not gonna like <laughs> purchase something that might be val more valuable to the National Museum and should be in a museum. I'm asking for new. So when I went home in 2021, I asked again and nobody of my uh, Ilocano uh, Weaver community contacts uh, could commit to, to, you know, like nobody knows, nobody's making them, we don't have any. So fortunately, our, our Itneg brother and Abra was, took the challenge and initial hesitation is that nobody's making them anymore, ma'am. Uh, you know, nobody knows how to make them. But I said, but Mano, you know how they are made. You can instruct them, right? So after a day or two, he said, okay, some boys want to take the challenge. So they made me two sets of, you know, Tingyan or Itneg, but she said, you can also call it Ilocano <laughs> uh, backstrap loom. And then, and then he asked, do you want me to put a warp on it? So go ahead, put a warp on it. And the kids, even um, the young people who tried it uh, with the warp, they said, oh, wow, this is kind of nice. Like they've never tried it. This is in Peña Rubia, in, in the, their weaving and dye cooperative. They've never tried a backstrap loom before. Some actually like it because it's so portable, it's easy, it's, you know, it's just refreshing for them. So he was so thankful uh, that it was um, like a revelation that maybe they should revive backstrap weaving uh, as well. Uh, at the same time, a design, uh, the blank that I was referring to that was showed to me in a, that was brought to one of my workshops, I had never seen uh, the combination of cat's paw um, uh, Banig, this is the Lucan blanket, and uh, snake skin. I had never seen that combination before. So when I went home in 2021, I asked, I had a feeling it would be an Itneg uh, weaver who would be able to produce it. So I asked Lucano, they said, oh, you know, the, again, it was the same um, weaving community from Peña Rubia. So he was so happy. I was like, ma'am, that is, I remember that from my grandmother. Maybe I even sold that blanket. <laughs> he was claiming, I said, Mano, you were, mom, I've been selling since 12 years old. So it's also important for us to remember, uh, to, to do that reclamation of what's potentially already, uh, about to disappear or what has actually already like, you know, disappeared. We can reclaim that, that concept in, I think in West African um, culture of Sankofa, this term that is so valuable to them, that it means it is not taboo to go back and reclaim what was lost. And I, I really, you know, put a lot of uh, weight in that and maybe feeling the burden of age. I'm feeling like, okay, you know, how much more time is it for like, you know, to take and identify these things and to be able to reclaim them and um, resustain them into, into the practice and into the culture. So my two cents. Yeah, hey, actually I wanna add on, um what uh, teacher Rachel mentioned about backstrap weaving, um, just a little bit about it. So I, um, there's uh, an IBID center in Kiangan wherein you can actually stay in, um, in their, uh, in the town, uh, Kiangan Ifugao, and then you can, um, you're required to stay for two weeks so that you get to learn um, backstrap weaving and you also um, get immersed in the, in the town's um cultural uh space so they get to you get to to tour around the rice areas and then learn about their um the, their livelihood aside from weaving so that's just actually a 
something that you want to try on if you're based in the Philippines or if you want to visit anytime soon. Um, I guess my quest, I my answer to the question is um, uh, on continuing. The tradition is um, right now, I when I started teaching weaving, I did um, more on the crafty side. I like the idea of... Um, being able to make something else with yarns aside from crochet and knitting because I came from that background um, and when I started learning uh, weaving that's also how I got into more research about it I've been reading about the history how we started um, how many how um, I mean other provinces were also doing weaving um, I guess I'm also gonna add on the um oh, what we want to continue is of course the process um of learning it um of course we can't ex um uh um we we don't want to leave the burden of um um uh leave the burden to the weavers on learning how to weave nah, they're the ones who are also weaving and keeping the tradition alive but also uh, aside from doing the uh, I guess it's nice for us to also learn about it, um, teach it to all, um, the people we know. Every time I teach weaving, it's very, um, uh, I guess, satisfying for them to to learn something new aside from that. But also when I approached, um, th there was this one time that I approached a homeschooling community um, and uh, I can't remember the the name of the the principle that they're following um there that's a name um but they're as a homeschool community they're trying to follow this but then the handcraft um involved in their curriculum is knitting and crochet so they approached me asking is there any way that we can make it more filipino tied up to the history of what we do so that the kids learning handcraft uh, will learn what we um, traditionally do so um i am supposed to be working on a series of handcraft wherein we will involve um basket weaving um mo mostly weaving since we have a lot of um that and then also from from so kind of like from from the plant to the textile or plant to the finished product since as an agricultural country we have raw materials that can um can be used to to create such um and we're supposed to be making use of our own um, raw materials to create our own products for um for a national consumption so um i guess another thing is um while we're learning i get to also um practice learning the patterns so in 2020 during the lockdown a friend approached me who's also working with weavers in Ilo I ilocos um the name is locano and it's chem um, and then she asked me if there is a way that we can not really translate but also um create some um create a way on how modern weavers can learn the traditional patterns so traditional patterns for for Inabel is so rich, um, but most of the motifs are um, uh, from the from everyday life. So, Kusikus uh, is um, used as a pattern for um, mo mostly for um, for protection. So, since it's an optical illusion and um, it drives away spirits, um, other motifs are based from like. Um, Dita Rachel mentioned the ferns, um, flowers, um, and then after after some time, it's also present in other traditional patterns. I also encountered weavers from um, Buhi Camarina Sur who weave modern uh, modern patterns. They call it modern patterns, and um, PTRI, uh, Philippine Textile Research Institute, um, will. Ha have this ongoing project throughout the Philippines, the one where they provide um, upright looms to communities who want to start a livelihood for just for them to start weaving. 
and they will introduce modern patterns. And uh, modern patterns are actually just di diamond quills. Um, if you're if you've seen that before. Um, and then we tried as um, it's not this the pattern that's being so um the kind of patterns that will be um, satisfying the market. They want to see something else and they will be copying different um, textile patterns that they think are um, something that they the market would like to buy. So traditional patterns wherein you, right now we're trying, we're also, we're bringing that back wherein we put a appreciation to the patterns that are involved in their life um so of course before there will be trades of patterns that came from different countries like india um but we developed our own patterns eventually so whatever we see uh, for example um, the most popular patterns would be um, from the nature so like i mentioned ferns flowers even fishermen um mostly from the pidilian um uh patterns so they try to imitate their lives and um, whatever they have in everyday life into the textile that they have. And um, hopefully, in the the more that we get to learn about it, um, the more we appreciate this, all of uh, their lives and the history of our tradition is written in the textiles that we have. So I guess that's what I, I wish we could um, pass on to more years to come. Thank you, Judith. Yeah, thanks everyone so much. There is so There are so many categories of things that we should be focusing on preserving. And I think we touched on a lot of different ones. Um, we have about 20 minutes left. And, you know, if anyone has questions, I'm going to just let you put them into the chat. If you have a question, I'm going to move into some of the other questions that came from many of you in the pre in the RSVP. Um, and I think this is a big one that also kind of feeds into what um, Judith was mentioning. I'll spotlight myself um, while I'm talking. But um, basically, you know, I think this question of you were just mentioning, Judith, the inspiration from daily life, the and this is true for textiles all over the world. Textiles are material storytelling and um, data holding manifestations, you know, of of a relationship between the environment, a relationship between other humans and each other. And um, there's so much richness and history that we can maintain and learn and pass on through these. And I think one of the big questions that many people had in the in the questions that people submitted were questions around protocol, questions around the meanings, uh, the deeper spiritual meanings of some of the of the patterns, and also about cultural appropriation, when it's appropriate to wear and use certain weaves. Um, and I know this is kind of, again, Anya and I came together because this was a big question, um, because of the use of the Cusicos pattern, which also has many other roots and many other intertwining histories that we don't know all of, again, as textile historians and as students of textiles. Um, it's also important, extremely important to recognize the it, you know, long histories of global exchange and trade and sharing and appropriation, misappropriation, theft, and also just, you know, person to person sharing and also the technology. I mean, I, we haven't talked that much about technology, but the technology of weaving and working on a, a gridded pattern also leads people and the innovation of the human mind with the material to certain conclusions that can also be shared. Um, you know, we have a lot of shared history with backstrap loom culture in Guatemala and in, uh, in China and all over Africa. So I wanted to just bring that in as, you know, an internet to, to really not see Philippine weaving as, you know, in a sort of vacuum of itself. Um, but to to acknowledge all of that other influence and how that's created. I mean, I'm personally in Japan and studying the relationships between Japan and Okinawa. And so I guess my question here is about cultural appropriation, about, you know, appropriateness of wearing 
and and also being able to while holding that international kind of or inter um, global uh, lens of textile history how do we also make sure to recognize and uphold and maintain the boundaries of what really is an indigenous practice um, that is still being practiced in the Philippines and acknowledging the um, really difficult and precarious situation of those of those ways of practice for people who are still indigenous and who were never colonized, um, if we're specifically talking about the Cordillera and um, regions like Manang Rachel is working in. So it's kind of a long spiel, but yeah, I'm gonna open that up if anyone wants to grab onto that. I will. Hi, um, um, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll go. Um, well, for me, I my approach is always to ask uh, community stakeholders. Um, when it comes to the textile, whoever is weaving the textile, I acknowledge that they are the ones who are the creators. Um, I will ask the community, community um, uh, leaders, um, whoever, knowledge holders, culture bearers, um, so that I can be more educated and informed. Um, if they ask me to share something with the community, if they don't ask me to share something with the community, um, whatever is their intent and wish um, is what I try to do. Um, and I really will take a community's lead. Um, and really that's how I approach things uh, because I um, don't consider myself as the expert. And also between cultures, I don't think that there is one way, uh, but also I am a relativist. Um, so I think culturally there, there would be differences on um, rules, guidelines. Um, and then regarding the other part, um, with global interchange in weaving, um, especially with Filipino weaving, and there's so much, uh, there, there was just an article how, um, a Southeast Asian, Polynesian, uh, trade has been going on, uh, between Central America since 1100. Um, and we can see those uh, exchanges in textiles uh, really strongly. Um, and they're uh, really beautiful connections. Um, but when it comes to appropriation, I think the, the rules or guidelines around how we treat textiles, especially uh, sacredness, um, changes. So we have to respect uh, the community, the communities themselves. Um, I myself, if I'm not a part of that community, um, I just uh, listen rather than, uh, you know, I'm, you know, if I'm not part of the community, I don't consider myself having a say. Um, so I will just listen and um, try to impart whatever it is uh, the community has to say. Thanks, Kate. I think Judith. Oh, it's just going to be short, I guess. Um, so uh, since there are a lot of debate before on certain textiles that need to be, um, um, that could be subjected, subjected for appropriation, it's really more on the intention. And I think for us, having not much knowledge about textile boils down to why, um, to how we can, um, uh, um, contribute to more education for everyone. So I, I, would admit, I, I would admit I don't know a lot about textile, especially when there will be a lot of um, there will be some sort of issues that will come up when uh, a, a textile was used for an um, um, not appropriately, like if, if it's not supposed to be on this certain, um, it's not designed to be something else. It's just supposed to be a blend. 
it and then that's when we will realize oh it's from pala and then um and of course those practices are in the community um uh, we hope that there'll be more education and more information that could be distributed. We don't yet know yet what type of material could be released. Of course, there could be some books and researchers that could um, contribute to that. But um, I myself wanted to also um, go to, um, I guess, more immersive um uh education on that and as an archipelago uh, arch archipelago uh, as a country where um technically islands away from each other it's hard for us to know all everything that is um uh, attributed to certain textile but um uh doing things with intention um of course is um as long as your intention is good but what you're doing with the textiles um, but apart from, of course, the issue of having more um, specific practices on certain ones. So before I was um, actually, I had a, in my first year of uh, doing weaving, I I was flagged before for weaving a Kusikos pattern because I was just learning that time and I was so, um, I was so amazed at how it's done. So I was um, looking at the, I don't have the binacol, um, actual, the actual textile on hand. I was just zooming in on the internet and I was trying to put it on graph paper and then translated it to a woven pattern. I actually have one right, right now, this one. So I kind of like made it on a smaller scale. Um, so at first I was, I was flagged down and someone, co um, met, uh, commented on my post if I, um, ask the weavers for, for permission um, and technically there is no weaver to ask for permission because if they you ask them they would be very happy to to know that you're learning and I would encourage my friend uh, the students that I teach to visit um, a community and talk about them that you know about warp <laughs> and you know about weaving and they would be very happy and excited to know that you you know what they do. Um, you're very excited uh, to learn it and very appreciative of what they um of the the labor that they do and the the whole process if you know about them. So um yeah, I think that's that's uh I hope I answered the question and um yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Judith. Um, and I'm going to also add an additional question as we kind of have 10 more minutes. And it, this is also kind of addressing what's happening in the chat right now. I'm just going to encourage everyone to just, if you have resources that you want to share, one of the main questions was, how do I weave? How do I start weaving? What do I do? Who do I contact? So it, I'm just going to kind of guide that, the answers to that into the chat while we address another really important question, which I think is um, really essential to this conversation. And that is um, JJ coming in for a question with Tita, Rachel, and everyone. How do we learn which weaving communities are in need of urgent support in terms of preservation, survival of livelihood? And um, I also want to, I guess, kind of come back to another question that's also related just in terms of, um, you know, questions of how how do we support not just uh, people in the Philippines, these rural peasant communities in the Philippines, um, and also um, women, you know, uh, other genders besides women. I'm going to bring that in as, as you know, a panel of people who mostly identify as women. And I think there's a large gender element that we're not really talking about because we're we're in a in a in amidst um, ourselves here, but. I think that's a really important element to draw in. Maybe Anya wants to add to this. So questions of who can we support and questions of livelihood, the gender question. And then Anya, I'll also plug the fact that, you know, a lot of the reason why this panel was delayed was because of the storm, because of the typhoon, and because you guys were doing real on the ground, grassroots um, damage control after, you know, your guys's weaver communities were affected by the many different catastrophes that are happening. And I just want to draw attention to the fact that weaving is, you know, 
an economic support system. And when that is cut off for people, there are drastic and very important human consequences to that. So yeah, I'm gonna maybe direct directly to Anya and then if Jeanette or anyone else wants to answer and Manang Rachel too. Um, thanks, Rebecca. Um, I don't have uh, my cheat sheet right now, so I don't know the statistics of like how many weaving communities are there in the Philippines, but there's a lot. There's a lot. And, and it, it's a hard question to answer because every weaving community has its needs and, and, and its struggles and its challenges. And um, you look at it at an enterprise level, but you can also look at it at an artisan level. And, um, and, and both have varying um, needs. So I think to me, the answer is when you um, engage with a brand or when you know of a brand and um, when they claim to like support the community, as a consumer, I think the, the challenge is ask questions, ask a lot of questions, be critical in knowing about the community and how they're actually supported sustainably. Because, um, I mean, I do not discount efforts where we purchase raw materials or we purchase finished goods and then we sell them. But I think it will change the way people do business with weaving communities or the way brands, whether or not here in the Philippines or abroad, partner with artisans. If um, we look at our relationship with them long term, it's not just kind of like a transactional um, relationship, but really be invested in the kind of impact that you're able to provide the community long term. So, because there's really a lot. And um, like, for example, with Antil, we work with about 20 weaving communities right now. Um, we have what we call our direct partners. And these are the ones where we implement our program because they have more needs, but they also have the business readiness to commit to what we require for them to be able to sustain their business. But there are a lot of, say, I'll probably set an example. Um, Bukidnon, for example, the community that Ma Ari closely work with, um, when we met the community, there was no existing weaving. It, it basically has died. Like They have two elders who know how to weave, but the younger generation didn't know how to weave. So we had to, um, with, with, with a dialogue with them expressing their desire to actually revive the craft, we helped each other and we did that together. So we organized the community for them to be able to to start weaving again. And there are a lot of these similar situations or scenarios where there are a lot of um, upland communities who have elders that know how to weave, but are not able to pass it on to younger women because they don't have um, the tools anymore. Um, they don't, they traded or they bartered the looms. Um, and there's also no access to markets. So. This is something that is still, um, you know, happening across uh, the country and across different communities. So I think, yeah, I, I don't have a direct answer, but that I think the, the way to be able to know who to support to is to ask more questions, ask more questions about the community and to really deepen your, your understanding and no knowledge of them. And if, it, if you can immerse yourself in the community, um, and 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 experience um, their way of life and and understand um, the reality from from their eyes. Manang Rachel, oh sorry, Jeanette, go first, and then maybe Manang Rachel can close it up. Okay, um, I was just gonna piggyback on Anya because it's like, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Oops, you're muted. Sorry again, Jeanette. Oh. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I said I was going to piggyback off of Anya because that's what I just keep doing in the conversation. But <laughs> um, from our perspective as a brand, um, what we noticed was that we weaving traditions 
are are dying, obviously for obvious reasons like economic viability, modernization, cultural shifts, and like what Anya said, like limited market access. So for Maari, we were looking for an organization like Ant Hill that we could trust is doing the research, is doing the field work, is doing the documentation and the preservation. And our way of being able to like vet that out was going there. And I think like us going there and being with Anya in the field and meeting the community created a, like a, it, it really like ignited the passion for us to like want to do this work. And so like from Ari, we, we try to always buy ethically and partner with people or artisans in the Philippines that are, you know, have economic stability practices that they're teaching these weaving communities so that they they can be like long-term and viable in the marketplace. Um, another big pillar of Ma'ari is storytelling. Like we, it's a very, very important part of the brand to share the story behind the artisan who's making the good you're purchasing, whether that's a weaver or a ceramic artist or a marble community. Um, so raising awareness and then of course, collaborating with artists, artisans just to keep their crafts going. Um, and then, you know, just learning and supporting other cultural institutions, like what you guys have started um, and just like really focusing on sustainable practices, because at the end of the day, like we've said it so many times, like we live in a capitalistic society and like what Monong Rachel was saying is that like, it's gonna, you know, these, these crafts and traditions get taken over by modernization. And it's really important for like, us because it's our heritage and our culture to 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 use our our privilege and our perspective to be able to uplift and shine light on you know these um communities thank you Jeanette Manong Rachel so you came back <laughs> I lost you where'd you go I think Manang is having, I'm going to spotlight you, Manang, but I think you're having a little bit tech issues. Oops. Oh, yeah. Christine um, on the chat room was just citing an example of um, the value of asking questions. So she's saying she's being sold something and she asked, like, where it's from. And they said, oh, somewhere in Abra. <laughs> and I think, you know, the challenge for consumers is to really just deepen the due diligence and you know, um, you know, who know who makes your clothes and how it's made and where it's made and and beyond that kind of challenge also their business practices to see how they're able to support that long term. I think we lost um Manang. Um, Rebecca, sorry, uh, just in the the kind of I guess culture of uh, tradition of heart woven conversations, I want to involve you in the conversation and ask uh the rest of the speakers or anyone in the audience like why do you feel conversations around cultural preservation and cultural continuity like why do you feel this space where we're having this conversation is important to nurture maybe that's a maybe it could be a way to close the conversation yeah that's a great question Anya and I, I really appreciate you looping me and everyone in um you know this is a great question like okay I guess I'll, I'll give a little perspective I, I'm sorry there's hammering happening above me I'm at my studio so I'm sorry that that I hope that's not too loud in the background but um yeah I think being a Filipino person in Japan right now and being around I mean I'm not sure how familiar folks are with Japanese culture but I think from in general we kind of have a sense of Japan as being like a very traditional place you know they are very very um concerned with the maintenance of their cultural practices from dance from food from um you know textiles like I think a lot of us probably before we even knew anything about Philippine textiles we probably knew something about Japanese textiles because that is such a huge part of the culture of Japan is you know indigo ikat um shibori you know all these different kinds of styles of of 
um, working with textile. And I think coming here and realizing the, the depth of investment that that Japan has put, not just as like a government and a country and the, na the national identity and mythology of Japan, but like just regular everyday people really have a really deep sense of pride and honor for their for their traditions and i think you know clearly there's a huge difference in the histories of japan and philippines you know philippines part of the philippines history is that we were colonized and occupied by japan and a lot of the reason why we have a lot of cultural loss is because of that occupation during world war ii and of the many other occupations and continued you know military occupation of the philippines by the united states government and there's a lot of many reasons why our cultural heritage is not at the same level of preservation as a place like Japan. But being here has really made me understand and realize and appreciate how a day-to-day -day, everyday person can utilize kimono or utilize a basket like this <laughs> or can utilize, you know, bamboo in their everyday life and that that's just something that people don't even consider or think about as being essential. It's just so integrated, mainstreamed into your daily life because no one has told you that that is wrong, essentially. And that your, for lack of a better word, indigeneity or your cultural history has never necessarily been a source of shame for you. And so that's really been revolutionary for me to come to a place that has that baseline of just straight up self-respect. I mean, and that can be taken to a much more extreme level of, of fascism, um, but I think it can also be, you know, uh, we can look towards, I really look towards Japan in the way that I'm learning the textile traditions here as how we can do it. And you know what they do? They just get together in groups. There's a aunties and people who just gather in the park and they want to go together and they go collect this thing and they pass it they pass down in small groups of people and i think that to me is one of the most interesting and important things that i've learned is like it is us it is like we're, we don't have to depend on no historian i mean some of us are historians and some of us are academics but we don't necessarily have to depend on the top down knowledge yeah. and like you know, like Manang Rachel said, she's looking at who can produce this loom for me, who can, who knows how to make the parts. We actually already know how to do that. We just need to like be active in, in asking the questions and getting them made, maybe learning how to do it ourselves, or maybe also talking to other people who are experts at doing those things that aren't us. So I do think it's a huge community, like Anya, you're asking like, why is it important to do this? Because no one else is really going to do it. Um, and I think that that, you know, the responsibility factor, like Manang Rachel was saying, the age thing, you're getting older, I don't know, can we continue to pass this down, what's going to happen? Um, we can't save it all. And I don't think that that's necessarily like what our job is. But I think to continually reflect on it, to figure out how we change um, our communities around us to honor these these ways of being. And also I think really wanna emphasize the fact that Jeanette brought up right in the beginning, which is that these are relationships with the world around us. Like this is a repairing, the work that we're doing to like understand this, these practices of working with plant materials. Oh, here comes Manang, this is perfect because I got to get off my high horse here. Um, the more we are able to reconnect with the practice, whether it's wearing it or working with the plants or dying or whatever it is, like whatever level you're at, um, it is a spiritual reconnection and a relationship building that's like only going to build and get better in the future. Like we are, we're very, very blessed that we can all be here to even acknowledge that, you know, we have people like Kate and Anya who are doing in community grassroots connecting that is allowing all the rest of us to really benefit and learn from those experiences of the weavers themselves and the, the embodied knowledge and the, the place-based knowledge. And I think that's because so many of us are not in the Philippines. That's something we really, we really um, strive to understand. 
but it's also very difficult. And so I, I want to just give props to you guys for doing that work and for really rejuvenating a lot of these practices for the rest of us who are out here. Oh yeah, we're going to plug a couple of fundraisers and I know we're going over time. I want to give the mic back to Manang Rachel, who I think Manang, did you get back? Are you here? Can you hear me? Shoot. Um, someone, Jamie, also just plugged uh, Manang Cynthia from Weaving Hand. And we are going to, I'm going to put, um, like in terms of other just badass weaver people out there, Cynthia has been an amazing resource and, um, you know, co just out there weaver that I've respected so much for quite a long time. And um, I'm just going to plug a couple fundraisers here. Cynthia also was recently diagnosed with cancer and their GoFundMe is going right now. And it would be great for folks if they want to donate or help support um, to, to donate to Cynthia first and foremost as just an incredible advocate and weaver and artist. And um, Ant Hill also supports various fundra fundraisers that you can check out at the sparkproject.com. And I also want to plug La Ing Hawaii. Um, we were able to support the production of this event through our donors, you know, just regular folks, students, and also Hawaii People's Fund. So I do want to make that plug too. And if anyone else has any other um, projects or anything you would like to share. I know Judith, I asked everyone to just put their links to their orgs and their businesses into the chat. And I still don't hear you, Manang Rachel. I wanted to give you our last word here. I think we're just having iPad difficulties. Um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate everyone being here. And Anya, I don't know if you want to add anything um, to this, but we also do have the recording, which I think is going to be a great resource for anyone who wants to go back. One other thing I would mention too, there was a question uh, from the from the group that was, is there any chance we can launch a published research on our weaves, weavers, or weaving industry? And I know there's like a ton of research that's already out there. There's people, um, I think Judith mentioned the Philippine Textile Research Institute. There's a lot of research going on, but I also just want to just say that, you know, we're all researchers in our own way, and we all have the capacity to be producing writing and photos and documentation and sharing what we're doing with each other. So I just want to um, encourage everyone that, you know, our research is not just in an academic journal out there that like four people are going to read. It's, it's this right here. Um, yeah. Anyone else want to share? Anya? Okay, we can just wrap it up. Maybe Monang Rachel will be able to send us her thoughts via email that I can include in a follow-up email. But yeah, maraming salamat. Agyaman kami. Thank you, everyone, so much for being here, especially for the folks calling in from the Philippines. I know Wi-Fi can be challenging. Yeah, and if anyone does want to add their connections or whatever you want to share in the chat, please feel free and... Um, Thank you so much. Sorry, um, Beck, because we're Filipinos and we love taking pictures, I just want to make sure we document this Zoom call. So for everyone who's com comfortable showing their faces, maybe we can just have a group photo to end this conversation. And it's a shame we didn't get any questions or answers from the audience, but we want to be able to keep the community alive and hopefully we'll, um, yeah, we'll get you guys to participate in more conversations. Oh, Kevin's here. Okay, um, everyone, a big smile. Photos, photo, photo. We'll, wacky, we'll, wacky. Do, we'll, do, we'll do two screenshots. Oh my God, I love the cute cat. Kitty. Okay, one, two, three, big smiles. Okay, one more. Uh, oh. oh, okay, we all fit in one screen. Oh, Perfect. hi, Amaya. <laughs> all right, um, have a great day, everyone. Have a good night, <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you again, Rebecca. Thank you, Lying Hawaiian Hawaiian. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You, Bye. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Kate. Thanks, Thank Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Manang. Thank you, Manang Kim. Thanks, Bye. everyone. So happy to see everybody. Same. Hi, Diwa. Thank you so much, everyone. Um.
I want to. Oops. Oh. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Judith. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Pause recording. Or yes. you did already? I did not. How do I? Where is it? Pause recording. Mm. I just want to. Shoot, More? I feel bad that um, Manang Rachel didn't get to. Hi. Wait. Manang. Okay, that's okay. Oh. Hi. Maybe more and stop recording. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can just stop it. Hold on. Shut the